Okay, uh, hello everybody. My name is uh, Paul Downen, and I'm here to uh, talk about a topic of unboxing and show to you uh, a kind of new uh, style of dealing with this called call by unboxed value. Uh, so uh, why unboxing uh, in practice? Well, uh, the good part is it lets us compile our programs and, and run them very fast. It leads to very good performance, uh, of course. Uh, but the issue is that if we're not careful, this can clash with higher level of abstractions in our programming languages. In particular, polymorphism um, becomes something that you have to worry about and how it mixes with uh, unboxing things, un unbox types of things. Um, and so now we have some fairly robust tools of dealing with this. Um, so in particular, levity polymorphism is in uh, Haskell these days. And it lets us talk about different kinds of types. Some of them are boxed, some of them are unboxed. Um, and gives us uh, this good way of uh, dealing with the difference. Um, and not only that, we can talk about things like representation irrelevance. So do I really need to know the representation of a particular type to compile the code or not? Um, so that means we can abstract out representations and let us write uh, a lot more programs, which is good. But if we're a little too ambitious, we can quickly get into the point where we're writing things that don't really make sense or have an operational meaning at all. We can't compile it. So we do have to be a bit judicious here and think about, all right, I'm allowed to kind of abstract over this as long as I know how to compile it. If I can't compile it, the program doesn't make sense. We have to reject it, which normally happens uh, by the type checker. Uh, and that sort of means if you run into one of these, you, you kind of need to know a little bit about how things compile to understand why this or is or is not allowed. So if you're not a compiler writer, that might be uh, a little intimidating to you. Uh, so I instead, I want to talk about kind of another road into this space, which is a little bit different. It kind of comes from the other direction, where uh, I want to talk about uh, some high-level reasoning principles, just basic functional programming and idioms in functional programming uh, that uh, gives me kind of uh, those tools to be able to write unboxed programs or programs with unboxed types of things. Um, I don't have to worry about what compiles, basically, Instead of worrying about, can I compile it? If I can write it, it will compile. Uh, and uh, I will be able to run the program. And well, at the start, I'm going to begin with the operational intuitions, but these aren't just some ad hoc things. They actually come from some other studies of other areas in logic and semantics that were invented to solve completely irrelevant problems to unboxing, but it turns out to line up exactly with those things that I need to do to deal with unboxed values in my programs. And so kind of uh, where's the payoff, or where's there at least something a little different? Well, uh, currently, right, uh, some of this techniques to deal with uh, unboxing and polymorphism in the style of levity polymorphism, I need to know uh, what are the types for my source program in order to have enough information to compile that program. But uh, after a certain stage, um, I'll do some transformations which uh, lose some of that precision and don't quite line up with a full type checking. And so kind of. What ends up happening is that the kinds of the types get preserved down to the lower level, but the types themselves don't quite survive, which might be a little bit um, unfortunate. Uh, whereas instead, kind of what I would rather have is I don't care if you start with a typed program. Right? Maybe you don't even have a typed, statically typed programming language to begin with, um, or they got lost along the way. That's fine. Um, so we can still compile and deal with programs that way. But if you do happen to have a well-typed program, that will be preserved down to lower levels. And so, for example, we can capture kind of low-level details in a type-safe abstract machine uh, and keep those invariants alive to further stages in the program um, without worrying about you know, kind of messing things up during translation. OK, so let's start out with kind of an introduction on you know, how to deal with unboxed values and why they're important. So here's like a really small, simple function. I want to sum up all the numbers down to 0. And uh, a big question is, uh, n is a number. Does it live? Where does it live? Is it in the register or in the heap? Right? And what's the impact of that? So if it's a register, this is a fairly fast kind of loop, if it's a register-bound int. But if it's in the heap, not only am I chasing n down every time around this loop as I decrement and go down and down, I have to allocate yet another box to store the new value. And so we're generating tons of garbage everywhere around the loop. Um, but if it's in the register, it's, it's much faster. And, and of course, we can change this a little bit and write it in accumulator style. And now this is a really fast chunk of code. If we know how to unbox the numbers, it's now just a tight little loop that updates two registers every time we go around in a circle. So that's really nice. Uh, but now, whoops, we're 
uh, working in nice high-level functional programming languages so I can have polymorphic definitions. And the question is, can this identity function really work with any type? Well, uh, obviously not, because you know, if x could be represented in a variety of different ways, then that means the machine code changes depending on its representation. So I need to know where it lives, how many bits does it occupy, how do I move it around? So that's information I need to know how to compile. OK? Um, and uh, things can start to get a little funnier and more interesting examples, like even in the simple application function. So what do I need to know to compile this? Well, uh, certainly I need to know what a, the x looks like, so what is a representation of a, because I'm moving the x around, but you know, what about b? You might think, well, after I call f, it's going to return a b to me, so I need to know where it is to pass it to my caller. That makes sense. But if uh, I know I'm going to do tail call optimization in my compiler, then actually app doesn't touch the, the result at all. So, so actually, the representation of b can be irrelevant, as long as I know a little bit of something about my compiler. Um, and this can even change if I make little tiny changes to the code. So if I A to reduce this, now I don't care about A or B at all, because I'm just moving a pointer, the pointer to the closure. So, so little bits. There's a lot implicit in these definitions, which may not be obvious if you're not experienced with how these programs get compiled. Uh, there we go. Um, and things get yet more complicated in higher order functions, right? So here's the, well, familiar mapping function. So I need to know about A's and B's to move things from one list to another clearly, but also uh, there's this call of f to x. And what does that really mean? Is this really a function call where I'm going to jump to the function and execute it? Or is it maybe a partial application because f is expecting more arguments? And that corresponds to different code that either I have to check something at runtime, or maybe there's some other invariance at compile time that I have to maintain. So I want to start now taking the segue to talk about what call by unbox value looks like through something we well, many of us will already know, which is called by push value, right? So the suspicious similarity in name is because they're very closely related. So you, if you know about call by push value, you're probably very familiar with the difference between doing and being. Those are types of values versus types of computations. And call by uh, unbox value adds one other axis of distinction, which is some things are atomic. There's just one of them. And some things are complex. There's a, a many in maybe multiple different senses. Uh, and these are really orthogonal. You can mix and match these two however you want. Um, and this has an impact to sort of the design of this little tiny core language. So um, functions are only ever called with unbox values, hence the name. I have to pass uh, unbox values. But there's a funny little tension here because you know, in, in this kind of style, being able to name something isn't a right that always happens. It's a privilege. Only some things can have a name. It's so only atomic values get to have names. So if I'm passing something that I cannot name, what do I have to do? Well, I just have to pattern match on it. There's no, no other choice. And the same thing with uh, computations, right? Those can be complex or atomic. What's the difference? Well, an atomic computation is something that it's ready. I can run it right now if I wanted to. But if it's complex, well, it's a function. I can't just run a function. I have to pass an argument, or really wacky things will happen as it looks at registers expecting inputs that I haven't filled in, right? So those are complex, and they take a little bit more to run them. So let's look at that sum to zero uh, function. And we'll translate it down to call by uh, push value first. And so if we start with a kind of call by value source, what we're doing really is sequentializing the little tiny steps. Uh, and so uh, the main difference here is in the, well, we do a check if our input zero. If it's zero, we just return one. Otherwise, we're going to separate the steps first, subtract one from the argument n then do the recursive call, and then add n back to the result of that. Now, it kind of looks like monadic style. So if you're familiar with monads, very similar to that style of thing. And so for call by unvox value, similar idea, but there's a few more annotations. So let's go through them one by one and talk about what's the same. So before, when we had that sequencing, that was the signal by the type f from call by push value. That's uh, represented by the ret in the type and just the sequence of either I return or I do th things step by step and get the value. So that's more or less something you already know. But there's a couple new things. One is to say I have a value. And this is sort of a signal saying, well, I can take a complex argument theoretically, but here I just have one value, which is a natural number. And that's sort of what value says. I'm just saying this single atomic thing kind of counts as something complicated, just happens to be one. Right? And so we have that there. And when we introduce and bind a, a, 
arguments and parameters that are atomic values, then you know, we need to say how they're represented to know kind of what the low-level code is to do with that. So that happens at the binding site. The other little wiggly detail is that um, at the end, we have this eval punctuation, which says that um, we're now ready to run, right? So I could take some arguments, but now I'm done. I'm ready to run. OK, so what are kind of the, how do the restrictions come into play? Well, um, I can uh, have functions that return multiple unbox results, like quotient and remainder at the same time. And so uh, certainly I can pattern match on the result, but actually I have to. In fact, in call by unbox value, I wouldn't even be able to say what the representation of the complex thing is. It's too complicated. So I have to match on it and name the things individually. Um, I could also pass in an unbox tuple. And so I can do that. I can pass in a pair of constants or a pair of things that have been given a name. That's a fine. But I can't really call this distance function, which takes an unbox pair with like uh, an x, y that's not a thing, because I can't name the unbox pair. I also can't apply it to the result of a function. Right? We'd have to call that first. And so how does polymorphism uh, look? Well, if we start with like a system f source where we have these explicit uh, type uh, parameters, right? And we have to assign a representation, right? So uh, by default, right, we could just say it's a reference, right? So we're just adding a little bit of information on how things are uh, represented. Uh, but I could do some sort of other fancy thing by saying, well, it's an identity function by passing this complex unbox pair of a float. And well, something represented as an int, right? Um, and these are kind of really different functions because they result in different machine code. And it's an error to sort of instantiate the first one on that complex thing because it's not expecting a complex type. It's a reference type. But I can always coerce something complicated into a reference by boxing it up. So box takes anything complicated and gives me a reference. Um, and I can erase all the types and still have enough information to know kind of how to run. What are the, the lower level uh, instructions? I don't really need the, the types. That's just for type checking type safety. Uh, so one of the neat things I want to talk about and kind of what is revealed is uh, kind of this idea of fusion of several different unbox types. Starting with familiar, you might be uh, kind of used to this. If I have unbox tuple, they kind of fuse. So if I want three things, I could represent that as a pair of pairs in a couple different ways. But really, it will all be flattened into the same triple. So it doesn't matter. These are basically the same at runtime, right? If I have unbox pairs of unbox pairs. Um, and the same sort of thing happens. Uh, with calls, right? if I pass in an unbox tuple as an argument, then I could have passed it in one at a time in a curried function. And, uh, well, they're actually the same. I'm kind of just reassociating the parentheses in the same sort of way. And that works due to the kind of second class status of certain things. right? So I mean, I can call f with an actual manifest pair or g with two arguments. Those are isomorphic types of things. They have all the same information in different shapes. We're not worried too much about the shapes. But these weird counterexamples just aren't allowed. If I wanted to do something, then I'm not explicating something I would need. So maybe it means, well, I've got the pair, but it's boxed, so I have to unbox it first, and then I can pass the pair. Or, all right, I'm passing h as some higher order function, and I'm going to have to allocate a closure and pass that. So that's kind of a, a separate uh, sort of step there. So we're used to doing that with pairs, but unbox call, or call by unbox value also has unbox sums. Um, and those also flatten in the same way. And what we're doing is flattening the choices, which is if I have uh, a choice of choices, and I really just have three choices. I don't really care about the shape. So they're enumerated in the same way. And so we can kind of flatten these. And pairs and sums distribute in kind of the expected way that you want, and it corresponds to the same kind of low-level code. Um, I will skip this example. It is in the paper. I encourage you to look at it. But I want to go on to some more fun stuff before we end. But basically, the idea very quickly is passing an unbox sum as an argument. What happens there if unbox tuples fuse, unbox sums as arguments are the same thing as saying I have a product of two different functions. And I encourage you to ask some questions or uh, read the paper if you want more info on that. So let's skip that, because I want to move on now to where all this comes from. So I try to lean very heavily on the operational intuitions that hopefully you have, and you have kind of some understanding on how things should or ought, ought to work. Um, but that's not where this came from at all. Right? Um, so where did this come from? Well, um, I've personally stared at these two definitions for many years. And um, I am definitely guilty of, of kind of telling the white lie that, you know, I mean, they're basically the same. I mean, look at them. I mean, I've got these two different kinds of types. 
They're arranged in exactly the same way. There's a slight difference in notation, but I mean, value looks the same as positive, and computation looks the same as negative. And in a lot of ways, they do align. There's a, there's a lot of intuitions where these really are about the same. So really, morally, they should be the same, right? But there's one annoying difference, uh, which is they disagree on who gets names, right? So in call by push value, only values can be named. But in focusing, I cannot name values because I have to pattern match on them. And that's basically the difference, right? So call by push value is about atomic things. Focusing is about complex things. And all the combinations, right? So there's two combinations of two, or four combinations of two choices of two. And there's sort of different ways of going between them. And we can decompose the uh, normal kind of shifts into these smaller, low-level operations. So I kind of want to stop there, uh, if there's any time for questions. Uh, but other than that, thank you very much for your attention. We have time for one short question. Good. I have a short question. Yeah. Have you thought about extending this to dependent types, for instance? Very interesting question. There's a little bit of words in the setup. Um, I, it's set up so that it kind of looks like there's a dependent type that's not really being used. But there's some interesting interplay with atomicity and complexity for dependent types that I think is very fun to potentially look at for another version. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. <laughs>